Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being with us today. Thank you for your patience while we have our two votes on ordering the previous question and the rule, whatever those do. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here to be part of a, of a bipartisan action, Democrats and Republicans together, and 105 different groups from around the country have joined together with this. So I stand here with my co-leads in the House of Representatives to introduce the Freedom of Religion Act. The Freedom of Religion Act would ensure that we cannot ban someone from this country simply because of their religion. We're all aware of some proposals, some of them unfortunately bedrock ideas in the current presidential campaign, that would incorporate religious discrimination into our immigration laws. These undermine the very principles of religious liberty upon which our nation was founded. We must speak up both against this hateful rhetoric and these destructive exclusionary ideas. Our voices must be loud and strong, saying no to discrimination of all kinds, including in our immigration system. This religious freedom bill is a rallying cry to reemphasize that America has always been a country that welcomed people of every faith. And with this bill, we blocked any attempt to exclude immigrants, refugees, or international travelers from entering the United States simply on the basis of their religion. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm proud to be a Virginian, where in 1777, in Fredericksburg, just 53 miles from the capital, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. It begins, quote, whereas Almighty God has created the mind free. And it ends, that all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion, and that the same shall in no wise diminish, enlarge, or affect their civil capacities. For over 400 years, people have flocked to America's shores in search of religious freedom. Article 6, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution bans religious litmus tests for Americans who seek to hold higher office. The opening phrase of the Bill of Rights bans both the establishment of a national religion and limitations on the free exercise of religion. Quite simply, a religious-based immigration and travel ban would betray the promise of freedom that gave birth to our country and it would hurt our national interests. At a time when we must have strong global relationships, it would hurt our economy, our standing in the world, and our diplomatic relations. Such a proposal would, could deny entry to world leaders, tourists, relatives of Americans, investors, not to mention scientific, business, and political leaders attending meetings here. Policies driven by fear and bigotry are as immoral as they are unwise. As we strive to build a more perfect union, we do well to remember some of the darkest stains on our nation's history. The exclusion of Jews fleeing the Holocaust, Japanese internment, the Chinese Exclusion Act. We refuse to walk that path again. <laughs> the United States is strong because of our diversity, because it is a place of refuge, a place that has and will continue to attract the best the world has to offer. If I may quote President Ronald Reagan's 1989 farewell speech, quote, I've spoken of the shining city all my political life. In my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace, a city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, those walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. So thank you for all of you for being here, the many groups that support this, and I'd now like to invite Congressman Mike Honda to address us. <laughs> or Joe, excuse me. Now that the chairman, or the vice chair of our caucus has showed up, I'd like to invite Congressman Joe Crowley to speak to us. Thank, thank you, Don. People do get Mike and I confused, as you can tell. We're very <laughs> But I, I, I couldn't be proud to stand with uh, all my colleagues that are here today, Jan Schakowsky, Don Beyer, Mike Honda, and the others, and all the folks behind us uh, who are here today to support uh, this important legislation. Let me thank Don Beyer for spearheading uh, this effort, this noble effort. Uh, this bill is about the very foundation our nation was built on, and that is the idea and the notion of religious freedom not just for some, but for all. It's why my grandparents immigrated here. I always say, as lovely as a land as Ireland is, 
it wasn't without its faults. We know the persecution that took place there, all around. But it's also why people continue to come to our great land to seek refuge from persecution today. In the wake of San Bernardino and the San Bernardino attack, we saw a disturbing pattern of violence and outrage against our nation's Muslim American community. When I visited a local mosque in Woodside, Queens to show my support and hear from the community, on Twitter, I was labeled a traitor. I was called un-American. I was, Don even told I should resign. And that's only the stuff I feel comfortable repeating. <laughs> there was much worse said about me. But that's nothing compared to the student who was bullied on the way to school because of his religion. Or the shop owner in my district in Queens who was viciously beaten and attacked by someone who said he hated Muslims. Or the child in that very mosque that I visited who asked me, and I quote, why does my country hate my religion? When their candidate for president of the United States, their standard bearer, calls for a ban on an entire religion from entering our country, this is what happens. Children ask if the United States of America hates their religion. Now we know what the other side will say in response to us. They'll say that we're pandering to minorities, that we're being too PC. But you know what we're being? We're being Americans. We're being a nation that stands for religious freedom and for tolerance. And that's what this bill is all about. So I am proud to join my colleagues in introducing this bill. I particularly want to thank Don Beyer, who's done a great job, not only representing his district in Virginia, but for standing up, and not because he, he has to. It's not politically correct to do it today. Uh, but to do it in the way in which you're doing, I applaud you for doing it. We must all stand up and ensure that the United States will continue to remain a model for religious tolerance and for religious freedom. And I think this bill and other motions like it will help bring America back to its senses. And Don Bayer, thank you very much. And thank you to all my colleagues. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who's here as well. She'd like to represent a state. Someday we'll get there. But, uh, And my good friend Andre Carson, he and I have, uh, have worked together on this issue uh, consistently over the past. I want to thank you for being here as well. And with that now, I know, I know you know him as Joe Crowley, but I know him as Mike Honda. Mike Honda from California. Thank you, Mike Honda. <laughs> well, I, I also want to add my thanks to uh, my friend, uh, Congressman Bayer and for his leadership on this very important bill and all the organizations that are here today. I'm standing in front of America. I'm standing in front of a United States of America, a United Group of America. And, uh, and I'm proud to join my colleagues uh, in introducing the Freedom of Religion Act to prohibit denying people entry into the U.S. due to their religious faith or lack of uh, a religion. And I think that the double negative really means that we want everybody to understand that you're welcome to this country as visitors, as tourists, as immigrants, as citizens, uh, regardless of what your faith is or whether you have a faith. This issue is very timely as you cannot turn on the TV without hearing attacks on immigrants and Muslim American communities. Calls for religious litmus tests are returned to the xenophobia from the darker chapters of our history. In 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act became the first law that excluded a specific ethnic group from the immigrating to our country. But Chinese were only the first, as this ethnic uh, litmus test be, uh, then became more extended to the rest of Asian groups of Asian backgrounds. Prejudice, wartime hysteria, and the lack of political leadership not only led us to 
ban certain people from entering, but also led us to round them up, as it were, with my community in 1942. In 1942, our government incarcerated 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry. Two thirds were US born individuals, simply because we look like the enemy. Now in 2016, we hear the same hateful rhetoric as mosques are attacked and our friends and neighbors of Muslim faith receive death threats. It took our government over 70 years to repeal the Chinese Exclusion Act and over 45 years to apologize for the Japanese American internment. We should not forget the lessons that we have learned the hard way. Today we owe it to our vibrant Muslim American communities and to our American values of religious liberty to do much better and to achieve that which we have in our Constitution, a more perfect union. I'd like now to introduce the member from the 51st state, Eleanor Holmes. <laughs> Uh, I, want, I want to thank my good friend, Congressman Breyer, from the state next hours. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I had practiced constitutional law before I came to Congress, long before. Uh, so I looked into this and said, why are we having to do this? This is a very important bill. The Constitution does say that there can be no religious bar to running for office, what you've just heard from my good friend, Mr. Honda, about the Chinese Exclusion Act, but nobody amended the Constitution after that. Uh, so we need this bill. The Constitution Act, the, con the Constitution of the United States does not specifically protect immigrants and does not give immigrants the entire array of constitutional protections. Well, I can't speak, I haven't done the necessary research for all of the constitutional protections, but I think I can speak for a religious bar. And the reason I think I can is because the very first Americans were refugees from religious oppression. It is unthinkable that in the 21st century uh, there would be a religious bar when you consider that religious oppression drew so many to our country in the first place and continues to do so. So if there is no constitutional principle and we know what it takes to get a change in the Constitution, nothing keeps us from passing a law uh, like the law I'm proud to be a, a co-sponsor of that says what I believe Virtually every American believes that there can be no religious test either for entry or exclusion of an immigrant to our country. That was the very first principle. <laughs> Thank you. That was the very first principle, uh, and it's time we put that first principle into law. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, the Honorable Andre Carson from Indianapolis, Indiana. To Don, and it's always good to hear from uh, Honda, uh, Madam Norton, who's a, a friend and mentor, and Jan Chikowsky, and to the uh, groups of people who are behind me who represent all that is great about America. Uh, you know, over 200 years ago, it was Thomas Jefferson uh, who wrote that the legitimate powers of government extend to such acts only as are injurious to others. But it does me no injury for my neighbor to say that there are 20 gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my legs. Now, Crowley and I have worked on these issues in the past, and I think it's very clear that knowing this, it is no surprise that uh, the one of Jefferson's proudest moments was crafting a religious freedom law for Virginia that uh, disestablished the Anglican Church. Now, Jefferson knew what many of us know very clearly today. The United States has been at its worst when religious freedom is in jeopardy. The burning of Catholic churches, 
uh, the attempts to force Jehovah Witnesses and their children to salute the flag contrary to their faith, and the attempted extermination of Mormons from Missouri were all dark chapters in our nation's history. But not all of that is completely behind us. Unfortunately, religious freedom is no less in danger today than it was in the past. Now recently, we've had some very special people, candidates, seeking the highest office of the land, who have deliberately spread mean-spirited and false information about Muslims. Uh, they've said that Islam hates America. They suggested that increasing surveillance on American Muslims is the way to go. And they want to bar Muslims from entering the United States of America. And to make matters worse, they've tried to stop immigrants, refugees, and international travelers from traveling into this great country. Now, as one of two Muslims in Congress, I know firsthand what it means to be attacked for my religion. But what's really troubling is that these men are running on a platform that is contrary to what this country was founded on. Because truthfully, honestly, regardless of your persuasion, if you're a theist or non-theist, an attack on one faith is an attack on all faiths. It's an attack on the First Amendment. It's an attack on the Constitution. It's an attack on the good works of our founding fathers, who were very complicated in their own right. But they ensured that America would be a society of religious expression. And it's an attack on the great strides we have made to ensure that people of all faiths have a fair shot at the pursuit of happiness. So I'm very proud to be here today and support this bill. I want to thank Don again. And this is an example that others should be inspired by. So thank you for having us. Peace. Thank you, Andre, very much. And our last congressional speaker is the Honorable Jan Schakowsky from Illinois. I want to also give my great thanks to Representative Beyer. I'm so proud to be a co-sponsor of the Freedom of Religion Act. Um, I stand here today not only a member of Congress, but the daughter of Jewish immigrants uh, who came to this country to find the kind of um, religious and economic and social freedoms that bring so many people to this country, regardless of religion. And I'm so proud to stand in front of this interfaith group of people, um, men and women and Republicans and Democrats, who stand for the this basic principle of religious freedom for the United States of America. In my district, which is one of the most diverse in the country, 40% of the residents speak a language other than English at home. And they worship in churches and mosques and temples and synagogues um, all over the, the district. And they do that in, in, in freedom and, and a sense of security. Um, so we're talking um, in some ways about this today because the uh, presumed nominee for President of the United States of the Republican Party has made it clear that, and he said it repeatedly, that if elected president, he would ban Muslims from entering this country. That's so astonishing to me, and I hope that it is, I know it's astonishing to everyone here that that would come out of the mouth of someone who aspires to be president of the United States, and I hope it's a notion that will be rejected by all Americans, regardless of religion and regardless of, of party. In addition to it being completely against our American values from the day, as uh, was pointed out, the very first people made that dangerous trip and came to the United States to settle a country where they could worship as they, they pleased, it is dangerous. It is, makes us less secure, not more secure. We want to be sure that the great Muslim citizens and, and uh, residents of our districts 
feel comfortable here, feel comfortable enough to go to law enforcement if they see something that is wrong, to feel confident enough to stand up against those Muslims who, are, who may be doing something that is harmful to the United States of America or its interests. We rely on the great community of Muslims that are in my district and in districts all over the country to stand up for the freedoms that America has um, and to call out things when, when they are absolutely not, not right. So this kind of ban would undermine the strength of our nation and give in to fear mongering and hate and division. Um, and, and so I am just so proud to stand with my colleagues here today with these wonderful advocates um, to stand out against the hateful rhetoric, um, to restore the kind of American ideal to this country, which we are, I am personally embarrassed to see being threatened in this year, 2016. So I thank all of you for being here today and stand shoulder to shoulder with you in standing up for religious freedom in the United States. Thank you. Well, we were so fortunate to have more than 105 national organizations come together to support this legislation. We're now going to hear from the leaders of five of them and their particular perspective, beginning with Rabbi Jason Kimmelman Block, who's the director of Ben the Art Jewish Action. Rabbi? In 1790, George Washington wrote famously a letter to the Jews of Newport, Rhode Island in which he laid out the principles of religious liberty that would be a, become a defining feature of this country. He wrote, for happily, the government of the United States gives, bigotry, gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. Now, sadly, there are voices within the society, indeed, voices that seek to sit in the seat where George Washington once sat saying that those who practice Islam should be prevented from entering the United States. Those voices ignore the fact that millions of our Muslim neighbors in the United States include not only first, second, and third generation Americans, but the one in four American Muslims who are African Americans, whose ancestors arrived on these shores not as tourists, not as refugees, not as immigrants, but as slaves. And historians estimate that one in 10 of those slaves that were brought to the, to the colonies on these shores practiced Islam at that time. Islam is not something new to America. It is not something outside that is coming here. It is who we are as a people in the United States. When Muslims are singled out, targeted, and attacked, it is an attack on Jews. It is an attack on Mormons. It is an attack on atheists. It's an attack on Catholics. It's an attack on Quakers. It's an attack on all Americans, and it is indeed an attack on the American idea itself. <laughs> now is the moment for people of conscience to stand up and seek a vision of government and society that does not seek power to attack and isolate those without power who may be marginalized in our society, but use that power to protect and defend those who are most vulnerable. And that is what this act does, and I congratulate the members here and all these groups for taking such a stand. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi, very much. We'll next hear from the Executive Director of the Council on American Islamic Relations, Mr. Nihad Awad. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Representative Don Bayers for his leadership, for his courage, I remember a few, few months ago 
when Donald Trump uh, made the um, un-American statement to ban Muslims from the U.S., he led the congressional delegation to visit the Islamic Center in Falls Church, Dar al-Hijra. That was a moment of leadership. That was a moment of pride for me as an American Muslim. Um, and I thank all the other members who joined you uh, to show a sign, a signal of support to the Muslim community. I stand before you as an immigrant myself, as a refugee who was welcomed to America. I was lucky to help found the largest Muslim advocacy and civil rights organization, which defends the Constitution that I learned about over the years. I became a success story like many American Muslims. We are here to build bridges, not to build walls. And Donald Trump has diminished the hopes of many people in America, especially those who live outside. This act, this bill, comes to restore hope in the American dream, in the American values and American principles. And it is time for us to help this bill succeed. I call on members of Congress on both sides to seize the opportunity and support this bill to make it succeed. And I believe it is a must. <laughs> because right now, really, there is a competition between fear and hope. Fear is gaining votes. Fear is leading people to the polls, but that's not the America that the world is looking up to. I hope that in November, hope and faith will defeat fear. It will only happen if we all work together to make sure that America is still open and welcoming to the refugees, to the needy, to the talents, because this is what made America great, and that's what will make America great again, not the fear or the hateful rhetoric. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wad, very much. Now hear from Rabbi Jack Moline, who is president of the Interfaith Alliance. Rabbi. As a rabbi, as an interfaith leader, as a resident of Congressman Byers' district and a former resident of Congresswoman Schakowsky's district, I thank Representative Byer and his colleagues in the House for, for introducing the Freedom of Religion Act. Freedom of religion means there can be no religious test for citizenship in this great nation. Freedom of religion means there can be no religious test for our compassion to those refugees in need. It is this freedom that has allowed faith to flourish in the United States like nowhere else. And it is this freedom that has enabled so many faith communities to be champions of justice and equality in our nation. Proposals to close our doors, to infuse our immigration policy with religious discrimination, betray that legacy, betray our core values, and betray the basic promise of the Constitution. That's why more than 30 religious organizations, including Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, and Jews, as well as people who profess no particular faith, have joined me in a letter calling on Congress to reject the politics of bigotry and division, and truly to protect the freedom of religion for all. Thank you, Rabbi, very much. Next, we hear from Larry Couch, who's the director of the National Advocacy Center of the Sisters of the Good Shepherd. Mr. Couch. Well, thank you for being here. I really feel honored to be with such prestigious people and people who have so many different faiths and uh, beliefs. The, uh, the National Advocacy Center uh, uh, serves as the advocacy voice with the Sisters of the Good Shepherd. The order was formed in the 19th century in France. And from the beginning, the order sought to serve people living on the margin of society, especially women and children. And there's no one more on the margin of our society than refugees and immigrants. The founder of the order, St. Mary Euphrasia, maintained that each person is worth the whole world. Based on the recognition of the value of each person, the order wholeheartedly supports the passage of the Freedom of Religion Bill. 
We should never turn our backs on anyone because of their religious or lack of religious beliefs. To do so would violate our deepest principles, principles that we cherish both as Americans and as people of faith. Thank you, Mr. Kautzen. Last and youngest, but certainly not least, uh, Yasmin Tabe, who's the legislative representative for the Human Rights and Civil Liberties of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Yasmin. Thank you so much, Congressman. Since 1943, the Friends Committee on National Legislation has lobbied Congress to prevent war, protect vulnerable populations, and support effective, principled policies to help build a more peaceful world. We are concerned and troubled by the increasing level of hostile rhetoric directed at Muslim Americans, refugees, and immigrants. Proposals to incorporate religious discrimination into our immigration laws by banning certain individuals from entering the U.S. based solely on their religious beliefs would undermine the very principles of religious freedom that our nation was founded upon. FCNL is proud to support the Freedom of Religion Act, and we commend Representative Don Beyer and the co-leads for introducing this bipartisan bill, which challenges hateful rhetoric directed at Muslims and ensures that the U.S. will remain an open and welcoming nation for all. Now more than ever, we must stand in solidarity against bigotry and injustice. And I thank everyone here for their work and commitment in supporting a more pluralistic nation. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all the members of Congress who have come and speak, spoken, and the, the wonderful eloquence from our many supporting organizations. And